So welcome, welcome, welcome to all those who are joining us online or in satellite groups. We're glad you're able to be with us for Bible study. Welcome to everyone joining us in person. If I haven't yet met you, I am Jill. I have the privilege and honor of getting to be one of our women's pastors here at CA alongside Coley, who you saw last week, and then Tanya, who we announced last week, who's going to be starting next week, which we're super excited about, and then Sandra, who's out of town this week, but is also new to our team and is our administrative assistant. So anyways, great to meet you if I have not yet met you. A few announcements for us today. We want to remind you that we do an offering here at Women's Bible Study. It is optional. Your leaders will have more info on that, but if you give to the Women's Bible Study offering, just know that that money is going to help with the costs associated with Bible Study. So so the cost of childcare, the beautiful books that you have, tech, video, all of that good stuff. We, are also, want, we also want to remind you guys uh, that we have our Easter services coming up in less than two weeks. So we are excited to be back here on our church campus in person to celebrate Easter, to celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus. And so we will have services on both sides of the street. If you're not super familiar with our campus, this is what we call the North Campus, the north side of our street, because it is on the north side of Colorado. And then across the street is our South Sanctuary because it's on the South side of Colorado. So we will have services in both locations on Saturday night and Sunday morning. And we will also have live and in-person preaching and worship on both sides of the street. So we hope that you will join us for that and invite some of your friends and family and neighbors and coworkers to join us as well. And then because of Easter, we have a lot going on on our church campus the week leading up to Easter. And so because of that, we will not be having an in-person women's Bible study on our campus next week. So you can come here next week, but we won't be here. So don't come here next week. Um, groups will be on break next week. Some of your groups may choose to meet, which is great. Your leaders can get you info on that. But we still have something in your study guide for you to do for the next week. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians 1 today. And for the next Next week you'll be in Ephesians 2. There just will not be any teaching for next week. So don't come to Bible study next week. Come to our Easter services and then the following week we will be back. So those are our announcements for this morning. Well, ladies, if you know me, many of you will know that I love to shop at Target because who doesn't? It is one of my favorite shopping spots. And as much as I spend money at Target, I also do a lot of Target returns. And I don't know about you, but I am one of those people who I buy a lot of stuff and then I return 95% of it. And so there's this spot in my bedroom, which my husband just loves, which is full of returns. And so once it all piles up, I decide that we're going to go and we're going to make these returns. And for whatever reason, in COVID, I started sending my husband into Target to do my returns for me, which again, he loves. So try that with your husbands. So several, just a marriage tip for you guys. Several months back, I had a pile of returns that I need to make at Target. So my family piled in the car, we went to Target. I stayed in the car probably because I was in a drive up spot, get my drive up order from Target. And I sent my husband into Target to do my returns. And he came back out, he handed me the receipt, which I don't usually keep paper receipts. And he said, hey, the guy at the register said you should keep this receipt. There was a glitch in their system. Uh, if you don't see the refund in our bank account, then you'll want to have this receipt so that you can get the refund. It was a decently large amount. I think it was like 186 bucks. So. I kept the receipt, I checked our bank account, and a few days later, there was a glitch in the Target system, but it was a different glitch than I had expected. It's not that they didn't choose to refund me, but they chose to refund me twice. So they gave me 186 bucks, which they owed me, and then they gave me another 186 bucks. And some of you are like, what's the problem? What's the point of this story? Go back and spend that money at Target. My conscience would not allow me to do that. And so I was just like, I gotta give Target their money back. Like they need my 186 dollars. So I call up Target customer service and I tell them the story and I say, hey, look, I, you guys refunded me too much. Can you please take this off my account? They're like, yeah, we'll look into it. We'll get back to you. They never got back to me. So I called them again, told them the same story. They said, yeah, we'll get back to you. And then a few weeks later, I got a letter in the mail from Target corporate saying, hey, we've looked into your issue. We see that we have refunded you your $186. This issue is now resolved. And I thought, no, 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 this is not resolved. You guys aren't understanding my issue. So I'm pretty annoyed at this point. I call customer service. I'm like, can I talk to a man? 
manager, a supervisor, someone. So this very nice woman gets on the phone. I tell her my whole story and I explain, I just don't think you guys are understanding. I don't want more money from you. I want to give you guys $186 back. She says, okay, I understand. And she's clearly looking at a computer or a screen of some sort. She's looking at my account and she says, hey, so look, I'm looking at your account and I see in the notes section that there's basically a note that says, if this customer calls back, please tell her that this issue has been resolved and she can keep the extra $186. And again, you guys might be thinking, that's great. What is the problem? Take that money. I was like, okay, so you want me to keep this money that you don't owe me, that I didn't earn, I don't deserve, you just want to give this to me? And she was like, I think that's what Target is saying to you. So I got off the phone, and instead of seeing it as a good gift, I immediately went onto my phone, onto my church app, and I gave that $186 back to the church. But before you say, well, that was generous, wow, that's not my point of the story. It wasn't actually my generosity. I did that because I was unable to receive what could have been just a gift of kindness, a gift of grace, something that I didn't deserve, that I didn't expect, that I didn't earn, but that could have been a gift to me in that season. And I share that to say that I had trouble receiving something that I hadn't earned and didn't deserve. And so I share this story because I think a lot of us struggle to receive. Now you might not struggle to receive $186 from Target. And if you're like, how do I make that happen? It was the Eagle Rock Target. I don't know what else to tell you. Um, but maybe you struggle with receiving words of kindness. Maybe you struggle with receiving love from others. Maybe you struggle with receiving a free meal. You know, when you're at lunch with, with a girlfriend and you're, they're like, let me pay for you. And then you're like, no, 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 let me pay for you. And then you go back and forth, who's gonna pay? We struggle to receive things from people, right? And each of us probably have our different reasons why it's hard to receive. I think at least for me, a part of it is I like to be in control. Allison talked about control earlier when we were worshiping. I like to be in control. I like to be active and doing things and know that if I'm receiving or if I'm getting things, it's because I've done something to earn it. And so I share this story because in Ephesians 1, which is the chapter that we're in today and that you've been in this past week, there is so much in Ephesians 1 that we just need to receive. And if I'm honest, when I read Ephesians 1 and was prepping to teach from it, I really struggled to prepare to teach from it. And a part of it was because I like to look at the scriptures for what I can do. I'm like, all right, give me my to-do list. What can I do for God? How can I obey God? And there is stuff for us to do in Ephesians. But in this first chapter, there's way more for us to receive. And so I want to pray right now before we jump into Ephesians 1. And I just want to pray that we, myself included, will be able to receive all that God has for us in this truth of Ephesians 1. So would you join me as we pray? God, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for how much you have done for us, Lord. And God, I love what Allison shared earlier when we were worshiping, that even the things we do, so much of life, most of life is out of our control, God. Ultimately, it's in your hands, it's in your control, and so much of what we do is really just us responding to you and responding to what you've done for us, Lord. So God, I thank you for all you've done for us, and I thank you uh, Lord, for all that you want us to receive from you. Ephesians has so much for us to receive, Lord. And so God, I pray today that for myself and each woman here and each woman online or in a satellite group, God, help us to receive your truth that's here in Ephesians 1. God, help us to receive the truth of what you've done for us that we didn't earn, we don't deserve, and we could never work for, Lord, but that you've just given us out of your grace. So God, would your Holy Spirit guide us this morning and would you speak to us, Lord? And would you encourage us? We pray all this in your great name, Jesus, amen. All right, ladies, well, we are in Ephesians 1 and here's how Ephesians 1 begins. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is the author of Ephesians. He calls himself an apostle, which is a title that means one who is sent. And what we see here is that he is sent by the will of God. He is sent because that's what God wants him to do. So he's living out of the will and the purposes of God. I think it's helpful to remember what Paul 
Paul says elsewhere about himself in the scriptures. So in some of his other writings, it's very clear that Paul knows that his calling is from God and because of the grace of God. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul knows that he hasn't earned the right to be an apostle. He doesn't deserve it. He couldn't work hard enough to earn it, but he is only what he is because of the grace of God. And I don't know about you, but if I'm honest, I don't always view myself. I often don't view myself with the humility that Paul has. I don't often find myself thinking or saying, I'm the least of these. I'm the worst of sinners. If anything, I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of good. I like to be the best. I'm the best at a few different things. But Paul has such humility humility, and he understands that everything he is and everything he has is simply because of the grace of God. We can tend to feel so deserving and so entitled, right? We can tend to think, gosh, I, God, you owe me this. I've worked so hard. God, I got up early this morning and I read your word. God, I prayed for this. God, I've worked so hard. I've been so faithful. I've been so obedient. I wonder what are all the things that we feel like we deserve or that we're entitled to today. The way Paul views himself reminds us of the truth that everything we are and all that we have and all that we are called to be is simply because of the grace of God. It's because of the will and the purpose of God. So Paul is an apostle. He is sent by God because of the will and purposes of God. And the audience he's writing to is the church at Ephesus. So Paul is writing to Christians. He is writing to people who are holy, meaning set apart. He's writing to people who are faithful. The word faithful is used there, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So he's writing to people who are faithfully following Jesus. And as the letter goes on, Paul begins to tell the Christians at Ephesus who they are in Christ. He's talking to them about their identity in Christ. And it's unclear from the text why Paul chose to do that. And you'll see in just a minute, and you probably saw it this week as you were reading, but you'll see as we read these verses that Paul spends quite a bit of time at the beginning of Ephesians telling these Christ followers what their identity is in Christ. And it's unclear from the text why he spends so much time doing that. Did the church at Ephesus struggle to understand their identity in Christ? Were they not super clear on their identity in Christ? Did they just need to be reminded of their identity in Christ the same way that those of of us who are in Christ so often need to be reminded of who we are in Christ. We don't know the answers to those questions or why Paul chose to wrote this, write this the way he did, but what we do know is that he spends a lot of time in Ephesians telling a group of faithful Christians what their identity is in Christ. And so when we read in a moment what Paul has to say, I want to remind us that for those of us here, if you're watching online, if you are in Christ, if you believe in Jesus and have placed your hope in him, then what Paul says about the identity of the Christians in Ephesus is also true of you. This is your identity in Christ. And if you're here, you're online, and you are not yet in Christ, I want to say we're so glad that you are joining us. We're so glad that you are here checking things out. Maybe a friend invited you to Bible study. Maybe you heard about us online, but we're grateful that you're here. And I also want you to know that the identity we talk about, the identity of people who are in Christ, can also be true of you. Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of us. He died for all of our sin. He took all of our sin upon him when he died on the cross and then rose three days later. So the good news of Jesus is open to all. The, you can be identified as a Christian through the grace of God by placing your faith in him. And I'm even going to give you an opportunity later for anyone who would say, I've never given my life to Christ, but I want to be in Christ. So I want us to begin by reading verses 3 through 14. There's a lot of good stuff packed into these verses. I also find it interesting to note that these verses, 3 through 14, originally in the original Greek, were one whole sentence. So when I read that, I was like, maybe that's why this was slightly confusing, because this was a lot of verses that were, at one time, one whole sentence. But here's what we're going to read from Ephesians 1, 3, for, 3 through 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. 
In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Great stuff, right? And that was a whole sentence. Uh, one of the things I noticed in these verses is that most of the verbs and the actions that we find in these verses are related to God. Most of the actions and verbs are things that God does as opposed to things that we do. So we read about all these different actions, all these different things that God has done on our behalf, but we read very little about actions that we have taken. So the first truth I want to encourage us with today is this. God has done more for us than we could ever do for him. God has done more for us than we could ever possibly do for him. In the verses that we just read here, I want to read to us just a list of some of the many things that Paul tells us that God has done for those of us who are in Christ. These are some of the things Paul says in Ephesians that are true of us who are in Christ and that God has done for us. God has blessed us with spiritual blessings. He chose us, predestined us, adopted us as sons, freely gave us grace, redeemed us, forgave our sins, lavished grace upon us, made known to us the mystery of his will, works out everything according to his will, and marked us with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. God did all of that for us. And he did it not because we earned it or we were entitled to it, not because we were worthy of it or deserving, but because of his great love and mercy and grace. God has done more for us than we could ever do for him. And now I want us to look at those verses and I want to read to us the list of things that we've done. So what we see in these verses we read in Ephesians that we have done, and here's the list. We put our hope in Christ. We heard the message of truth we believed, and we obtained an inheritance. That's what Paul says that the Christians at Ephesus have done for God or as a response to what God has done for them. And that's a much, much shorter list than what God has done for us, right? And even that short list, we are only able to do those things because of God's grace. All of those things, our belief in God, our hope in him, the, the inheritance that we've obtained, all of that is our response to what God has done for us. Ephesians tells us that God chose us to be in Christ, that he predestined us. So for those who are in Christ, God chose you and he predestined you. Predestined meaning that before we ever existed, God chose who would be saved. Now, you might hear that and you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, how does that work? Did God choose us? Did we choose God? What about free will? Is God forcing some people to choose him or not choose him? Do I have free will? Don't I have free will? And here's the deal. Ephesians says that God chose us who are in Christ before the foundation of the world, but then it also says that we chose God. It says we put our hope in Christ. We believed in Christ, which means we chose Christ. So which is it? Did God choose us? Did we choose Christ? And two quick things that I'm going to say on that. One, if you have really hard questions about predestination, I would love to direct you to Coley. I don't know where she is, but she would love <laughs> to answer all of your questions. So if you don't have her contact info, I will give it to you. Her personal <laughs> cell number. She would love to answer your tough questions about predestination. And secondly, um, secondly, I think that 
I think that on this side of eternity, this is just one of those things that is impossible for us as humans to fully grasp and to fully understand. I really appreciate how a commentary I read about Ephesians responds to this topic of predestination, and the quote will be on your screen. It says, the doctrine of election or predestination is not raised as a subject of controversy or speculation. It is not set in opposition to the self-evident fact of human free will. It involves a paradox that the New Testament does not seek to resolve and that our finite minds cannot fathom. Paul emphasizes both the sovereign purpose of God and our free will. So he, referring to Paul, he took the gospel of grace and he offered it to all, but then to those who had accepted the gospel, he, Paul, set forward the doctrine of election. So the truth is, ladies, I don't know how predestination works. You can try and email Coley. I don't think Coley knows how predestination works. <laughs> Our human minds cannot fully comprehend what it means that we choose Christ and that if we've chosen Christ, then that also means that God chose us to be in him before the foundation of the world. But what I do know and what I believe we can know is that if you are in Christ, then it is only because of God's grace. You are responding to all that God has done for you. And if you are not yet in Christ, that invitation is open to you. God wants, Coley shared this last week, that God wants to be found by us. He wants us to find him. God also wants you to be found in him. So God wants you to seek him. And he says that those who seek him will find him. So if you're not yet in Christ, that invitation is open to you. Ephesians 2.8 says, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We don't earn our salvation. We don't deserve our salvation, but it is the free gift of God in Christ Jesus. So if God chose us and saved us and redeemed us and forgave us, if God has done more for us than we could ever do for him, then what is our response? How does God want us to respond to that for those of us who are in Christ? And that brings me to point number two. The best that we can do for God is to praise and glorify him. The best that we can do, the best possible thing we can do for God is to praise and to glorify him. The only right response to all that God has done for us is to praise and bring him glory. In the verses we just read in Ephesians, Paul began by praising God. And then he repeated this phrase, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of God's glory. He said, we were chosen in order that we might be for the praise of God's glory. Isaiah 43, seven in the Old Testament says, bring all who claim me as their God for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. We were made for God's glory. The word glory refers to honor or excellent reputation. So we were made to praise God, to bring him glory, to honor God and all that God is. So if we were made to live, if, if those of us in Christ are to live for the praise of God's glory, then that means that we need to bring him honor. The way that we live should reflect God's character, his attributes, his heart, the things that God cares about, his splendor, his excellence. Everything we do as Christ followers should point to God and the beauty of who he is. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, for his honor, for his praise. And I wonder, how are you and I doing today in doing everything we do for the glory of God? For many of us, if we're honest, we are so prone to live for our own glory, right? We want the honor, we want the praise, we want the acclamation, we want people to praise us and see all the good in us. And the truth is, we can't take credit for anything good in us or anything good that God has done through us. Everything good about us is only because of God, and every good thing we've ever done is also only because of God and his grace toward us. So what would it look like to live for the praise of God's glory? What would it look like to live as women who are praising him and bringing glory and honor to him in every season of life? And when I say that, I also want to acknowledge there are some of us here today who would say, hey, I'm in a really good season. And if that's you, praise God, that's awesome. There are also some of us who are here today and would say, hey, if I'm honest, this is, this is a hard word for me to hear because I'm not in a season where I just naturally want to praise God. 
there are a lot of us here today who are in really difficult and challenging seasons. There are some of you who have lost loved ones. There are some of you who are in the midst of losing dreams. You're struggling with unmet hopes or unanswered prayers. There are some of you here who have relationships that are struggling. You're in a marriage that's more difficult than you thought when you committed to marriage. You're in a relationship or a friendship. There's something going on in your family or with your kids. There's things just feel that just feel hard and you feel like I am grieving, I'm in pain, I don't even know if I see any hope right now. And what I would say is, I'm so sorry for that painful season and for that season of suffering, but I also believe God's word when he says that he works all things together for good for those who love him, right? So no matter what season you are in, if you love God, then his word promises that he will work all things together for good. And I was even thinking when the worship team was singing that song about seasons earlier, seasons change they just change. The season you're in might feel like it's going to last forever, but with God, seasons change, right? And so there's hope for that. So all that to say, for those of you who feel like I am in a painful and tough and challenging season, so how do I praise God and live for his glory in the midst of that? One thing I would just encourage you is I think living for the praise of God's glory in a challenging season means that we need to come to God with our honest pain, our honest hurt, our honest disappointment, our brokenness. Even if you feel angry at God, I've had seasons where I've had to express my anger towards God. Say, God, I'm so angry. I'm so disappointed with this. But in the midst of that, we also need to make the conscious choice to praise God, to praise God, to be in his word, to, to let praise be ever on our lips, right? And to say, God, even though what I'm going through is so difficult and I wish this wasn't my season, I still praise you, I still honor you, I still want to bring you glory. Help me to keep doing that. So oftentimes we choose to praise God regardless of whether or not we feel like it. So God has done more for us than we could ever do for him. The best that we can do as a way of responding to what God's done for us is to live for his praise and for his glory. And then third and finally, third truth I want us to see is that God will continue to do more for us than we could ever do for him. God will continue to do more for us than we could ever do for him. In the last section of Ephesians chapter one, Paul tells the Christians in Ephesus that he has been praying for them. And here's what we read starting in verse 18. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in in the one to come. So one of the things that Paul prays for the Christians in Ephesus is that they would know God's incomparably great power for us who believe. And he says it is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. What this means is nothing is too big for God. No situation, no relationship, no marriage, nothing is too big for God. Nothing is beyond the great and incomparable power of God. And for those of us who are in Christ, if you're in Christ today, I also want to remind you of the truth that that means you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live in ways that we could never live apart from him. The Holy Spirit has, is so powerful and so great. And so don't forget the truth that if you're in Christ, you are not alone because the Holy Spirit literally is dwelling inside of you and is with you. A 19th century preacher named Charles Spurgeon once said, the very same power which raised Christ is waiting to raise the drunkard from his drunkenness, to raise the thief from his dishonesty, to raise the Pharisee from his self-righteousness, and to raise the Sadducee from his unbelief. So where do you need the power of Christ in your life today? Where are you maybe trying to control things or make things happen? I, I don't struggle with control, so I'm just talking to you guys. Um, <laughs> Where are you trying to control things or live out of your own power or your own strength to make things happen? And you need to surrender and say, God, I can't do this without you. I need your resurrection power. I need your power that raised Christ from the dead to be at work in my life or in whatever season I'm in. In Matthew 19, Jesus said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all 
things are possible. So where do you need to ask or where do you need to keep asking God to show up in power in your life and to do whatever seems impossible to you, remembering that whatever seems impossible to you is impossible for you, but it is not impossible for God. And then also, where has God already shown up in your life in great power? Remind yourself of the ways that God has powerfully been at work in your life. God has done what seems impossible, and he will continue to do what seems impossible because of his great and incomparable power. So as we close, ladies, I want to give us two ways that we can respond to the truth that we've heard today from Ephesians. And I want us to hear from the Lord. I want us to invite God to speak to us um, and show us how he wants to respond. So as I give us these two different ways, I want to invite you to take a posture of prayer. So you can set aside your journal if you want. You can bow your head. You can close your eyes. But Do whatever you need to do in this moment to just be focused on you and the Lord because this isn't about your neighbor or the friend next to you. This is simply about you and God. And I want us to invite the Lord to speak to us. And so I want to pray for a moment and then I want to give us two ways that we can respond. So God, we want to take a moment to just pray and ask that you would guide us, Lord. Your truth is so powerful, God. There's so much for us to receive in Ephesians, Lord. Um, But God, most of all, we want to receive you. We want to receive what you have for us, God. And so, Lord, I pray that as we spend some time responding, that we would respond in whatever way you want us to, Lord, that we would see what it is that you're inviting us to, what it is that you're speaking to us, Lord. So, God, we even pause for a moment just to be silent before you and say, God, would you speak and would you show us how to respond? So two ways that we can respond. The first is there are some of us here who would say, I am not yet in Christ because I haven't yet said yes to Jesus. I haven't yet put my hope and faith in Jesus and believed in him. So you haven't yet obtained the inheritance that could be yours in Christ because you have not said yes to placing your faith and trust in Jesus. And if that's you, I wanna give you an opportunity to respond to Christ and to say yes to him for the first time. The Bible tells us that each and every one of us was created by God and for God. We were created on purpose and for a purpose. God loves you. God loves us so much that he died for us. He sent Jesus to the cross to die for our sin. And the Bible tells us that while God created us out of his love and while he created us on purpose and for a purpose, we've all sinned, meaning we've all missed the mark. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. The penalty for that sin is death. If we want what we deserve, then we deserve death and that's what we should get. But God made a way for us by sending Jesus Christ, his one and only son, to take our sin upon himself and to pay the penalty we owe so that we don't have to. Jesus went to the cross. He took our sin upon himself. He died for us. He rose three days later. And God's word tells us that all who place their faith and trust and hope in Jesus Christ will be forgiven for their sins, will be made right with God, and will receive the gift of eternal life. They will receive the inheritance that we only have in Jesus Christ. And all of that is only because of the grace of God. So if you are not yet in Christ, if you're here today, if you're watching online and you are not yet in Christ, but you're tired of living with your old identity, you want to live in the identity of who you can be in Christ, then I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. And if you're ready to do that, you can simply pray right now and you can just pray, God, I confess that I am a sinner in need of a savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin. God, I believe that Jesus went to the cross to die for my sin, that he took my sin upon himself, that he rose three days later, and that I now have forgiveness because of what Jesus has done on the cross. I place my faith, my hope, and my trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I commit to following you, God, all the days of my life. 
And if you prayed that prayer, ladies, we welcome you into the family of God. We welcome you into your new identity in Christ. You're now in Christ. You are saved. You are forgiven. You are made new in Christ. And you're an heir. You have an inheritance now simply because of what Christ has done for you. If you did make that decision, it is literally the best decision that you could ever make with your life. We want to celebrate with you and walk with you in your journey. Your next step is to get baptized, but would you also let me or Coley or your Bible study leader know so that we can walk with you in your journey of following Jesus? And then secondly and finally, one last way to respond. This is for all those who would say that you are in Christ. And for some of you, you might say, I've been in Christ for decades, or I've been in Christ for years, or some of you are like, I've been in Christ for 30 seconds because I just gave my life to Christ. And we love that. But if you are in Christ, then I wanna remind us of the truth of what Ephesians says about our identity in Christ that is, is separate from anything that we could do or earn. It's our identity in Christ because of God and his grace. Earlier, I read over us a lengthy list of things that describe our identity in Christ and what God has done for those who are in Christ. And so I wanna read that over us again now, but I'm gonna read it slower, and I wanna just encourage you to invite God to speak to you as we read this list. And would you just be reminded, would we be reminded of who we are in Christ and all that God has done for those who are in Christ? So here's what we are told from God's word that is true of all those who are in Christ. Here's what God has done for those in Christ. God has blessed us with spiritual blessings. God chose us. God predestined us. God adopted us as sons. God freely gave us grace. God redeemed us, meaning he purchased our freedom through his blood. God forgave our sins. If you're in Christ, all of your sins are forgiven. God lavished his grace upon us, his unmerited favor. God made known to us the mystery of his will. God works out everything according to his will. And God marked us with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That's all that God has done. All of that is what God has done for those of us who are in Christ. So just take a moment to sit in that truth, to receive from God, and invite God to speak to you. Father God, we love you. We are so grateful for all that you have done for us, Lord. And God, I thank you for anyone who said yes to you for the first time today or for the first time online or in a satellite group. God, thank you for every salvation that is represented here. Thank you for those who've been following you for decades and those who've been following you for years and those who've been following you for minutes, God. Thank you, God, for the gift of faith in you. We don't earn it and we don't deserve it, Lord, but salvation is your gift to us, Lord. Thank you for your grace and thank you for our identity in Christ. God, I pray that for those who are in Christ that we would leave and walk out of this identity, God, that we wouldn't try to earn our salvation or do things as a way of earning your love or earning your forgiveness, but God, that we would live out of our identity in Christ and that we would do things simply for the praise of your glory. Help us to leave this place and give you glory, God. Even in our Bible study groups right now, Lord, would we, everything we say and do and talk about, would it be for the praise of your glory, God? So Lord, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us through Christ. We love you, God. We pray all this in your great name, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.